Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth series of videos in neurobiology. In the first series, we looked at the history of neuroscience, how people started thinking about the brain. In the second series, we looked at the membrane in more detail and various membrane properties that shape the responses of neurons. In the third series, we looked at the action potentials. Uh, how are these generated based on various types of voltage gated conductances and how the action potentials are conducted along a neuron. So basically in the second and the third series, we have looked at the components of the nervous system, the membranes, the neurons. And now in this series, we are going to look at how these components interact with each other. So how do the neurons talk to each other? How does the activity of one neuron affect the activity of another neuron? And this is important for us to understand uh, before we can understand how the brain as a whole system functions. Some of you may be wondering why we have invested so much time in talking about the action potentials. And why have neurons invested so much resources? They have various ion channels to generate the action potentials, then myelination to speed up the action potentials, nodes of runway to regenerate them, and various ion pumps to maintain the gradients that are disturbed during the action potentials. We have been saying that action potentials are the currency of neural activity. So what exactly do we mean by that? Exactly in what way do the action potentials affect something in the brain? This will become clear as we go along in this series of videos. But in a short summary, action potentials determine the communication between two neurons. So if we consider a contact point between two neurons, a synapse, and if this is the first neuron, the exon terminal of the first neuron that gives outputs, and this is the dendrite of the second neuron which receives input. This communication happens in the form of neurotransmitters. And the important point is that the neurotransmitters are released only when an action potential reaches this exon terminal. So in that sense, the action potential determines when this neuron gives some information to the next neuron. So in that sense, the action potentials are the currency of neural activity. And if you have a graded potential, that is a small depolarization in this neuron, which is not crossing the threshold of generating an action potential, then that small depolarization will typically not result in the release of neurotransmitters. But there are some exceptions. Uh, so there are some neurons that do not have action potentials at all, uh, maybe because they do not have the voltage gated sodium channels. And in those neurons, there are mechanisms that allow the release of neurotransmitters even in the absence of action potentials. But by and large, uh, especially in vertebrates, most neurons do have action potentials and in those neurons, action potentials are essential for the release of neurotransmitters. So the action potentials are very important for the functioning of the brain. People have been thinking about synapses for more than 100 years now. We have seen the drawings of Ramoni Kahal in the beginning of this course. And based on those drawings, it became clear that the brain is made of many, many neurons. And these neurons contact each other at well-defined zones. Charles Sherrington, a little bit later, uh, coined the term synapse to describe these kinds of zones of contact uh, where the neurons communicate with each other. Charles Sherrington was also himself a Nobel laureate uh, who had done quite a bit of work on understanding how simple nervous circuits such as reflexes function. And also one of his important contributions was in training a large number of scientists in the field of neuroscience. And many of those scientists themselves became prolific researchers and further trained many scientists. In fact, there is a website called Neurotree which keeps track of who trained under whom and if we look at these academic pedigrees uh, in this website Neurotree, then we find that a lot of modern neuroscientists can be traced back to Charles Sherrington. So he's like the great grandfather of the field of neuroscience. Now, although people have been looking at synapses for a very long time, it was not possible to see the structure of the synapse in great detail with the normal microscopy. So it was not clear how the synapses function whether the communication was electrical or whether it was in the form of chemicals, that was not clear. 
and a german scientist otto lewy uh, later showed that the communication was chemical at least at the synapse between the vagus nerve and the muscles of the heart so just to refresh your memory in one of the initial videos we saw the 10 cranial nerves so these are the nerves that go from the brain to different organs in the body and they control the functions of these various organs so one of the nerve goes to the heart so otto lewy would take out the nerve and the heart from a frog and put it in a petri dish and he saw that when the vagus nerve is stimulated the beating of the heart is slowed down so it is clear that the vagus nerve is controlling the heart but what is the nature of this interaction between the motor neurons in the vagus nerve and the muscles of the heart that was not clear and he did a very clever experiment that showed that this interaction was in the form of a chemical and at that time that chemical was not clear so he just called it vagus stuff because it was coming out of vagus nerve but later it was uh, found to be acetylcholine let's think about what that experiment could have been that showed that the communication between the motor neurons and the heart muscles was through a chemical this was a very clever and a very simple experiment in fact that did not require any complicated equipment i'll describe this experiment on the next slide but i urge you to pause your video here and think about it for a few minutes and see if you can come up with a very simple experiment that can show that the communication could be by the chemical means okay so i'll now show the experiment and when i pose this question in a regular class one of the suggestions i get from students is that uh, maybe he measured the concentrations of different chemicals in the medium in the petri dish and uh, observed that some chemical was changing in concentration well that could have been a possibility but that would still be a very complicated experiment to do especially if we did not know which chemical was involved in this process to start with Uh, because uh, without knowing that one would have to measure the concentrations of various possible chemicals and if the concentration changes are relatively small then then it would be a very 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 difficult experiment to figure out if which chemical is changing in concentration what otto lewy did was actually much simpler so let's look at that now so here is the cool experiment that otto lewy did in a petri dish he kept the vagus nerve and the connected heart and he stimulated the nerve and he was able to see that the heart rate slows down as expected and then he collected some of the fluid from this petri dish around the heart and now comes the clever part he puts this fluid on a, another heart in a different petri dish and this heart is not connected to a vagus nerve now it's just an isolated heart and when this fluid is applied on it he was able to show that the heart rate here also slows down which means that this fluid contains some chemical that is able to transmit this effect and of course he would have done some control experiments where if you just take the fluid before the vagus nerve stimulation then this does not happen which shows that the stimulation of the vagus nerve releases some chemical uh, and that chemical is able to cause the slowing of the heart so it's a very simple experiment does not require any fancy equipment but this had a profound impact on our understanding of how communication happens between neurons or between neurons and muscles and for this work otto lewy received the nobel prize in 1936 along with henry dale henry dale was able to figure out what that chemical is so he was able to show that it was acetylcholine later there is also an interesting story associated with this experiment it is believed that otto lewy was thinking about this problem for a long time and one night he had a dream about this experiment so he woke up in the middle of the night he scribbled some notes about the experiment and then he went to sleep again but the next day when he woke up he found that his handwriting was so bad that he could not understand what he had written and he was frustrated the whole day and the next night again he had the same dream and this time he woke up and he went and did the experiment and the rest is history before lewy's experiments the general understanding was that the communication between neurons might be electrical in nature and then his experiment showed that the communication might be chemical in nature 
and that has sparked a lot of debate in the community on how the communication really happens now although he was able to show that the electrical activity might result in release of some chemicals but what people find hard to believe was how this chemical signals would eventually convert back into electrical signal on the post synaptic side and that was unclear um, so basically the community was divided into two groups one group thought that the communication in neurons is primarily electrical in nature uh, and any chemical changes that are being observed might be secondary and the other group thought that the primary mode of communication is chemical and this chemical activity should be able to result in electrical activity uh, with some unknown mechanisms as the experimental techniques improved in the following decades we learned more about synapses and we came to know that there are actually both kinds of synapses present in the brain some synapses are electrical in nature where the two neurons are directly connected to each other and some synapses have chemical transmission where the two neurons are not connected so let's look at the differences between the two kinds of synapses in a bit more detail here in electrical synapses the two neurons are closer to each other at the point of contact they are of course connected but if we look at the separation between the membranes of the presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron in the nearby regions then it's on the order of 3 to 4 nanometers so it's a very very small distance and in the case of chemical synapses the separation between this membrane and this membrane here is bit more uh, it's 20 to 40 nanometers an order of magnitude more than what we see in the electrical synapses of course the the cytoplasms of the two neurons are connected in the case of electrical synapses while they are disconnected in the case of a chemical synapse in terms of the components the electrical synapses or gap junctions are made of special type of proteins which are the gap junction channels and in the case of chemical synapses the components are basically these vesicles that contain the neurotransmitters then special zones in this membrane that allow the release of neurotransmitters and then receptors on the postsynaptic neurons that receive the neurotransmitters the means of transmission of the signal from one neuron to the next is ions in the case of electrical synapses so these charged ions are directly flowing from one neuron to the next and carry the current and in the case of chemical synapses these are the neurotransmitters in terms of synaptic delay so is there a time gap between the signal in the first neuron and the signal reaching the second neuron that gap is almost zero or very very small in case of uh, electrical synapses because the ions are directly passing through just like they are moving within a neuron but in the case of chemical synapses because these neurotransmitters have to be released and then they have to bind to the receptors so this process takes time and there is a short delay uh, on the order of a millisecond or, or or slightly more than that and in terms of direction of transmission because in the electrical synapses the two neurons are connected to each other the ions can flow usually in both the directions so these synapses are bidirectional whereas in the case of chemical synapses there is a different kind of machinery on the side that releases the neurotransmitter and a very different machinery on the receiving side so the transmission can happen only in one direction at a chemical synapse so these are unidirectional 